Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, we're so delighted to see you. I'm Stephen Norper. I'm the Senior Vice President of the Korea Society, uh, which is based in New York, though it's the Korea Society of the United States. Uh, and it's a, a real treat to be here. I actually am a professor of international relations uh, and a graduate of the Fletcher School, uh, but have been a long admirer of uh, Corbell and uh, certainly your distinguished legacy with people like Condoleezza Rice and Madam Albright and others. Um, Today is very special to us. We had the privilege of having uh, Dean Hill at the Korea Society earlier this year for a fascinating conversation. And we've actually had thousands of downloads of a podcast of a conversation between Ambassador Hill and Ambassador Minton. And we thought we would take some of that here and expand a bit on it at a very critical time. Certainly, we've all been uh, moved, gathered by one of the tremendous stories of the year, which has been the challenge of North Korea. And, it's, uh, and how we in the international community deal with crisis management. And we thought that we could eventually get to some of those issues, but really talk about the other Korea, which is the successful Korea that we all know, the, the global Korea uh, that is South Korea, and that has emerged as a regional hub and a regional leader that has been a host for the G20 and the Nuclear Security Summit uh, that has uh, been the proud host of a Korean cultural wave, the Hallyu, uh, and features people like Psy with all of those hits for Gangnam Style, and now Gentlemen, and it's just a, a wave that doesn't seem to be ebbing. And so we thought, what better uh, treat than to have really two of the thought leaders uh, in the United States in the form of Ambassador Hill and Ambassador Minton. Uh, certainly, your dean needs no introduction to you, uh, but you know a statement of statement of great note. A four-time ambassador, former assistant secretary of state for East Asia Pacific, and really a guiding force in the dialogue. Uh, certainly, with the accomplishments of the 2005 agreement, uh, and then some, which you see we still make reference to in our most recent sit-down in Korea uh, by Secretary Kerry. And also we have Ambassador Minton, uh, who is the president of the Korea Society. He was ambassador to Mongolia uh, from 2006 to 2009, and he has served three tours of duty with Korea. Uh, he was in charge uh, among those uh, as deputy uh, chief of mission and charge, the deputy ambassador. He also served as director of the Korea desk, and he has also spent a large uh, portion of his career on Japan. So we're dealing with two of the great regionalists who will help guide us in terms of a discussion on Korea. And what does global Korea mean? And how does it help guide us in terms of management of some very serious situations that we're dealing with today? Uh, Ambassador Hill, thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Mark, let me uh, welcome you to the Corbell School. It's great to see you here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you know, Mark and I, uh, I, I think it's fair to say, Mark, we go way back. Yes. Uh, we were together, we worked together in the State Department's policy planning staff <laughs> under a director of the policy planning staff named Paul Wolfowitz. Uh, that was before anyone had ever heard the term neoconservative or anyone had thought of bombing uh, or invading Iraq. I think we were before all that. Yes. Uh, seriously, it was like uh, early 80s. So anyway, we've uh, kept in touch over the years and uh, really Mark is one of our foremost East Asia uh, uh, experts in the, in the State Department, having served in Japan and Korea, and of course in, in Mongolia, which is really a kind of a go-go place these days when you look at uh, you know, what's happening in that economy. I don't think they've uh, been south of uh, you know twelve percent growth in the re in recent years, but anyway, um, Mark, I think this is a great occasion to to talk about uh, uh, Korea. Now, people in the states, when you mention Korea, they assume you're talking about North Korea, and I always explain there's there's a there's a country called the Republic of Korea, and then there's a sort of prison camp which we call uh, uh, North Korea. So, um, but in fact, uh, the real dynamism on the Korean Peninsula, the real excitement being generated in the Korean Peninsula is not uh, uh, that of Kim Jong-un, but rather the kind of global platform that uh, uh, the Republic of Korea operates on. So I wonder if you could maybe talk a, a little about how that, uh, how that impacts uh, what the Korea Society is doing, but more, more generally as well, how um, the Republic of Korea is doing in the world. Well, thanks a lot, Chris, and uh, I want to uh, 
uh, add my uh, a special thanks to you uh, uh, for inviting me here. Uh, you're quite right. We go back a long way, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted to uh, come here for the first time at the Corbell School. I've known about the achievements of, of the Corbell School for years, and uh, and I'm, I'm delighted to, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, well, exactly as you said, and as Dr. Norper suggested, uh, we uh, have at the Korea Society, uh, we have to pinch ourselves because uh, we read in the newspapers every morning about some North Korean statement or threat made against the Republic of Korea or the United States, or actually you can pick almost any neighbor of the DPRK, which is North Korea, uh, and it is the object of uh, threats. Um, uh, but at the Korea Society, when we look at our very broad audience, uh, not only New York, but uh, all around the country, because we increasingly reach a very large audience through podcasts and, and online programming, which is what we're doing today. Um, the interest is really uh, still there on North Korea, but it's diminishing uh, in contrast to the rising interest in Korea as an economy, uh, as a democracy, uh, and as increasingly a global player in international politics, and uh, certainly, uh, and very recently, uh, Korea's uh, uh, cultural outreach, including uh, K-pop and the Korean wave. Um, and uh, most of our programming is beginning to move in this direction. Uh, I'd like to take maybe just a few minutes to suggest um, uh, how uh, global Korea, if I can use that phrase. I'm talking about, of course, the Republic of Korea, South Korea here. How that has uh, uh, risen uh, and how that has evolved over the uh, last uh, few years. Uh, to start with, I think there's been a continuous interest in Korea as an economy, uh, first of all, and then as a democracy. Uh, for several decades now. Uh, the story of what used to be called the miracle on the Han, that is the growth of the Korean economy from having roughly the GNP of Mali in the 50s to uh, one of the uh, dozen or so uh, largest economies in the world. This is something that's developed over the last 20 or 25 years. More recent than that, but equally successful is Korea's development of a, a vibrant uh, democratic political system uh, from, from the period of the shift to military rule to civilian rule uh, in uh, the early 90s. Uh, and that story uh, is equally uh, as famous now. Uh, these two achievements, both the economic achievement and the political achievement, now offer a model to many other countries, especially neighboring developing countries, uh, for how they want to go. I, as pointed out, I was ambassador in Mongolia. And the Mongolians uh, actively seek uh, Korea's uh, expertise, uh, both economic expertise, um, political expertise, uh, and expertise in such issues as good governance and anti-corruption uh, as uh, lessons uh, or uh, materials that can be applied to the Mongolian situation. And Mongolia isn't alone in doing that. Uh, many of the developing countries of uh, uh, South Asia and uh, Inner Asia, Central Asia, are also uh, very conscious of and uh, interested in learning selectively, because no one can copy Korea, from the Korean experience. Um, so that, that is the foundation of uh, Korea's uh, global position. Uh, but in recent years, it's gone far beyond that uh, to a more uh, active uh, diplomatic role. As was alluded to, the Korea uh, hosted the G20 uh, meeting uh, a couple of years ago. G20 has become, in the last few years, the most important <coughs> international uh, body for coordinating uh, action among the major states of the world. And Korea hosted, was the first non-European, non-North American host of the G20 meeting a few years ago. Korea also hosted last year the Nuclear Security Conference, which was a, a attempt by all the leading um, uh, countries of the world to uh, uh, get better rules of the road to prevent uh, proliferation of uh, materials uh, that would be suitable for developing nu nuclear weaponry. 
On the cultural side, I think many of you are aware that Korea will host the uh, 2018 uh, Winter Olympics in Korea. Uh, Korea has uh, also in recent years uh, really stepped up into a major role of international peacekeeping through the UN. Uh, Koreans are, have been deployed in roughly nine peacekeeping missions uh, around the world, places as far flung as Somalia, Lebanon, uh, Haiti, and have made a major contribution. Uh, Korea is uh, one of the top ten contributors to the UN peacekeeping fund. Uh, uh, thus enabling the UN to have the financial wherewithal to send peacekeeping missions. For the next two years, uh, Korea will also have a very direct role in international peacekeeping and uh, all issues uh, having to do with the UN's involvement uh, with international affairs because Korea has uh, joined the Security Council um, and it will be there for the next two years as one of the rotating members of the Security Council. Uh, it's already, uh, it's only been there a few months, but it's already been in the presidency of the Security Council in February. It's already made it clear that it, it has several issues it wants to uh, pursue on the Security Council agenda. Uh, green development or sustainable development is one issue. Uh, international security being Korea and facing North Korea is obviously another. Uh, another aspect of uh, uh, Korea's growing security role is uh, Korea has become an important uh, participant in what is called the Combined Tactical Force. Uh, this is a group of states that can deploy uh, naval assets to the Indian Ocean to uh, uh, encounter uh, uh, piracy uh, operations. As you may know, there's a terrible problem in the Indian Ocean from pirates coming mostly from Somalia. Uh, and the Koreans have joined that. Uh, they've sent uh, 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 naval assets out there. And uh, the Koreans actually uh, have uh, experienced some of the toughest engagements. Uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, Korean naval assets were very uh, involved in uh, capturing some pirates and uh, rescuing some ships that had been taken over by pirates. Um, so this is another aspect of their, uh, their activism in international <coughs> diplomacy and international peacekeeping. The third uh, element I want to, the third wave, if you will, of Korea's globalization, of course, is uh, cultural. And when we talk about that at the Korea Society and have programs on, on that, we talk very broadly. Uh, one of uh, the aspects of uh, Korea's international cultural uh, outreach isn't much mentioned and that's missionary work. Many of you may know that a large part of the Korean uh, population is Christian. And, uh, and, and Koreans have now uh, moved to the forefront in, uh, among international uh, missionary efforts. And so uh, Korean missionaries are found all over the world. And, uh, and in such a, a role, of course, uh, they have a religious uh, mission but they also have become uh, deeply concerned uh, about such issues as humanitarian relief and human rights. And I think uh, that that experience by a very large uh, missionary community feeds back into Korean society and to religious organizations within Korea society and helps to uh, uh, sustain an interest uh, in human rights and humanitarian um, work uh, in Korea itself. Um, the Koreans have also uh, stepped up their uh, aid uh, uh, programs to the rest of the world. Uh, Korea is now uh, a major uh, aid donor. In fact, Korea is the only country that has moved in the last 50 years from being a major aid recipient, as it was in the 50s and the 60s, to a major donor company com country. In the last few years, uh, Korea has promised to uh, double and then triple uh, its, uh, its uh, uh, aid fund. Uh, a couple of years ago it was just under about a uh, billion dollars a year and now it's moved over that and, uh, and it's, it's headed uh, even higher. So the Koreans are becoming a, uh, a, uh, a significant uh, player in international assistance. Uh, the last part of this of course, as I said, is uh, cultural. Uh, and has to do with uh, uh, Korean cultural products. Um, this uh, this uh, Korean cultural presence began regionally with Korean uh, television dramas in the 
in the 90s uh, and in the first uh, decade of the, this, cent uh, this century. Uh, Korean uh, dramas became very popular throughout Asia from the Philippines to uh, Cambodia to Mongolia, Inner Asia. Uh, but of course there's a language barrier there. That when these programs are presented in these countries they have to have subtitles. So there's a certain limitation. And Korea, Korean television dramas and to some extent films which have also become quite popular internationally and are winning prizes at Cannes and Berlin and, and even in New York um, and being shown uh, in Europe and New York there's a certain limit to uh, how far you can go perhaps with Korean films because of subtitles. But now uh, a new aspect of uh, Korean cultural, uh, culture, which is music, what is generally called K-pop. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Psy is the best known example of that, has uh, begun to make an appearance. And this kind of culture, music culture, is beginning to penetrate uh, Europe and uh, North America despite the language differences, because in this case it does not make so much difference. And also this music culture is penetrating uh, Europe and North America through social media. That is, it's becoming known mostly through downloads uh, uh, on YouTube and other social media. Uh, so uh, the effect of Korean culture, popular culture, is, uh, is beginning to spread much more broadly than it did, say, in the 90s. So uh, I've probably gone on for too long, but this is a brief outline of uh, the ways in which uh, Korea's uh, international presence has steadily expanded uh, economically, politically, international diplomacy and peacekeeping, uh, and finally culturally over the last 20 years or so. So I don't want to um, continue this sort of rivalry between Korea and Japan. They seem to be getting along very well. But uh, as, as a real expert on Japan, how can you compare and contrast what's going on with Korea, between, in Korea and in Japan at this, at this time? You know, this is, uh, this is a very interesting uh, issue. Uh, and I was thinking about that uh, as uh, we were doing some programming and even some joint programming with the Japan Society. And I think this, strangely enough, is uh, the way that Korea benefits from sort of being uh, a middle-sized country. Uh, Korea has no choice but to reach out to the rest of the world. And it has developed a, a stance in the international community that requires uh, reaching out uh, to the rest of the world, not only through trade, uh, but uh, for uh, political engagement, diplomatic engagement. Korea needs, for instance, uh, uh, the United States and the international community to help uh, with its security issues vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. And uh, Korean uh, culture, if it were to remain purely Korean, uh, would only appeal you know, to 50 million people. Or I'm saying that the penetration of North Korea is something that's hard to measure. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but, but Korea has realized uh, that uh, if it moves out internationally, not only uh, will uh, it become better known internationally, uh, not only will it have more influence internationally, but it'll make a lot more money uh, internationally. Uh, it's hard to underestimate how much money uh, Korea is making from uh, uh, K-pop, mm -hmm. uh, from, um, from music and from dramas. The, yeah. Korean um, uh, entrepreneurs uh, are training young uh, singers and singing groups uh, to perform in Japanese, Chinese, Thai, uh, Tagalog, uh, so that when they go to these countries, they're Korean singing groups. When they go there, they can actually do singing in these languages. Um, and so uh, what you have, in fact, now is a popular cultural industry in Korea that is a savvy about um, uh, marketing these products is Samsung is about electronics uh -huh. and Hyundai about cars. So, you know, Mark, when we were in past Korean assignments, one of the big issues in Korea was IPR 
and uh, intellectual property rights. And people say, oh, Korea will never quite figure out intellectual property rights. They'll never accept the idea that uh, in our time uh, or in the 80s, it was, uh, you know, cassettes. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. But now, Korea has a real interest in uh, protecting intellectual property. I mean, they don't want the Filipinos to be uh, making pirated tapes of these, uh, of uh, Winter Sonata and, uh, right. you know, hit programs like that. I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting how Korea has, by getting on the other side of that kind of, uh, I mean, by developing those kinds of cultural products, now has a real interest in uh, the international system there. Right. And I think uh, Korea, because of this experience, and it is a beneficiary now of uh, respect for IPR, is, uh, is coming uh, uh, to a position of uh, being an advocate for this. I remember we had lunch with one of the major uh, Korean producers of uh, pop groups. Uh, I shouldn't say which one, I guess. And uh, he was saying, uh, you know, uh, we're, it's, it's great how fast our overseas audience is growing, but they're stealing us blind. Uh, yeah. Because a lot of this uh, was being taken and not paid for, and he yeah. was very concerned about that yeah. as a businessman. Yeah. Do we have to worry about Psy not making enough money in this? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, yeah. I don't think. Uh, All right. But I'm sure his lawyers are going to go after people who illegally downloaded stuff. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I wonder if we could, um, I mean, I think you're a spokesman for Korea, but uh, I mean, one of the really interesting things for me over the years it was, you know, when I was in Korea in the 80s, Korea had this real kind of interest in a relationship with China. And at the time, it was kind of an interest vis-a-vis -vis trying to get the Chinese, pull them a little away from the North Koreans toward the ROK. But I think, but, but when I got back there in 2004, and in the meantime, of course, they had established diplomatic relations, and uh, Kim Woo Jung of uh, Daewoo had, you know, started this sort of opening up, et cetera. But Korea still, there was this kind of real interest in China in a way that um, hadn't been expressed before. It was almost a more cultural interest. And so now we see in Korea, uh, we see Korean students studying in China, often because of economic uh, right. you know, reasons. So you can get a good education in China for less than you might, well, you can't get a better education than the one you get at this school. But I mean, there, there, are, there are other places where I think China competes. Uh, so now, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting. And yet, and yet politically, China has not made uh, the great leap forward, if you will, to understand that the successor state in the Korean Peninsula is, is the ROK. But I wonder if you can just kind of talk about sort of broad attitudes on the China relationship at this point. Yeah, well, I think this is a, a good moment for us to segue. Uh, maybe we'll get back to global Korea uh, in the questions, but. Uh, yeah. I think it's a good uh, point to segue into a consideration of where the uh, Republic of Korea stands vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors in the, in the larger sense, and yeah. as you said, with China. And it's, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I see parallels uh, in Korea uh, in the reaction that, uh, that all the surrounding countries, all around uh, Korea, uh, Chinese periphery have. It's kind of a love-hate situation, yeah. I, if I can put it that way. Um, China is terribly important to the economic development of, uh, you know, Thailand or Mongolia mm -hmm. or Korea. But at the same time, there's a real concern about just the size and the uh, gravitational pull of China. Yeah. And, and there's a little concern about being sort of strong-armed by China yeah. on territorial yeah. issues and the rest. But isn't that what global Korea is all about? Because you yes. can leverage your position exactly by using a global platform. Yeah. That, yes, that, I mean that's a that that's a, a comment that goes right to the heart of it. You know, global Korea, it, even the cultural part of glo global Korea, is actually promoted by the Korean government. And when you ask why is the Korean government doing this, the Korean government is doing this, of course, because they want Korea to be even though it has a small population and it has a small plot of land on the uh, globe, they want it to be re uh, recognized as a major player and a significant uh, pl international player. Yeah. But beyond that, I think there's a 
just straight balance of power appreciation that Korea, in order to balance some much larger neighbors, uh, uh, has to uh, leverage them uh, through its international uh, presence. Uh, Korea isn't the only country to do this. Um, I don't want to keep on returning to Mongolia, but uh, when I was in Mongolia, even the Mongolians are doing this. Why do the Mongolians reach out to the United States, to Europe, to Japan, and to Korea, and to Australia, and all these other places? They're trying to get a little breathing space vis-a-vis -vis China. And although I'm not, I've never heard anyone in the Korean government in public actually articulate that, and Korea's in a much stronger position itself, uh, don't you think that, uh, at base, that the Koreans are trying to do the same thing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one little footnote about Mongolia that you know a million times more about than I do, but they always talk about the third neighbor. Right. And, uh, of course, they're a country sandwiched between Russia and, and, and China, and so they'd come and talk to us about we're, we're the third neighbor. It was kind of this nice sort of metaphor for the closeness of the United States. Then I heard them using third neighbor to talk about Japan. <laughs> then I heard them using it for the European Union, and I felt a little too timed <laughs> when I, you know, it wasn't just about us. Very disappointing, but. It, yeah, I mean, anyway, it's, it's yeah. like, uh, may I introduce you to my eighth wife or something? I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, they got, got all these close yeah. relationships. Yeah, yeah, right. I, you know, who is your third neighbor, yeah. actually? Um, uh, Chris, I'd like to turn the tables on, yeah. on you and uh, a bit. And uh, when you talk about um, uh, the Republic of Korea trying to obtain uh, some leverage vis-a-vis uh, -vis its uh, larger neighbors, Japan, China, uh, Russia, uh, even to some extent the United States, even though we're allies, um, the, um, the, the extra burden that the Republic of Korea carries, of course, is this just isn't positioning itself. It's positioning itself with these countries vis-a-vis -vis the continuing problem they have with North Korea. Yeah. And we've reached an unusual uh, position in dealing with North Korea since the diplomacy you engaged in uh, some years ago. Uh, there has really been uh, no other game afoot for dealing with North Korea. Korea. And since then, North Korea has become, and under its new leader, uh, extremely belligerent. Uh, I, I think it's more belligerent now than, than the entire time that I've been. So you don't think Kim Jong-un is a great reformer? <laughs> well, he is the world's, uh, uh, you know, best looking man, uh, as was pointed out by uh, The Onion, I believe. Yes. Uh, but, uh, and I, I can go along with that. But no, reformer, I don't think he gets that title. But one gets the feeling, Chris, that we, uh, we, we have to look at the North Korean situation, and particularly the, the, the Koreans have, the South Koreans have to look at, the Republic of Korea has to look at the North Korean situation and perhaps recalibrate a bit about how this problem is going to be handled in the long run. And I wonder if you, you know, based on your vast experience, uh, have any sense of, of what that recalibration has to, the direction in which it has to go at this point? Yeah, I think, um, you know, everyone looks at North Korea from, you know, their own, their own vantage point, how they approached it. In my case, uh, I'd served in Korea uh, in the 80s, and then I came back in 2004. And I remember as I was getting ready for uh, coming back in 2004, I read Don Oberdorfer's uh, real basic book that anyone going to Korea ought to read called The Two Koreas by uh, Don Oberdorfer, who was a former Washington Post writer. And very early on in his book, he makes a point in very eloquent terms about the division of the Korean Peninsula how it basically, this is not like the division of Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, this has to do with a division that took place through no fault of the people involved. It was one of these sort of great power uh, divisions. And of course, a lot has changed uh, since those negotiations. Uh, so can in, we get and, back? Can we get back? Can yeah. Humpty Dumpty be put back together again? Are we going to have to address this with an yeah. entirely different model? 
Yeah, I mean the whole idea was to make sure we were flying in formation with the South Koreans. No more damage to that relationship. That was number one. Number two was to try to get together with the Chinese mm -hmm. and to say to the Chinese, look, um, you know, we realize what North Korea has meant to you in your past. I mean, after all, there are these Chinese uh, Korean War associations. I mean, on Sunday afternoon, the people who get together, the families get together and talk about, you know, great grandfather or great or, yeah. or grandfather who was killed there, et cetera. This is not a totally unemotional issue in China. And uh, there's also, you know, the fact that there's so much old think in China that is, if you get, uh, uh, a, uh, if you have a situation where, you know, S Korean Peninsula unites and, South Korea is a successor state. There's a victory for America, defeat for China. So there are a lot of problems there. But I'm convinced that the reason China does not do more is that there is still a mountain of mistrust between the U.S. and China. Mm. Um, sure. I think if we develop to, I'm sorry to use these hackneyed phrases like strategic trust, if we were able to develop that, if China were able to understand that in the context of a united Korean peninsula, and that's what they fear, they put pressure on North Korea, and the, the, it, it's ironic, the Chinese think it's more fragile than even we do, that um, if we need to convince the Chinese that if, if there's no more North Korea, it doesn't mean we're gonna have US troops on the Yalu River or you know, CIA listening posts on the Yalu River. We need to get through that with the Chinese. I mean, frankly, I don't know about you, but my reading in Washington is if we had a united Korean Peninsula, people would say, mission accomplished, let's pull out of Osan. I mean, there, there would be that kind of, uh, mm -hmm. of attitude. So um, I think we really need to work on the Chinese. We can't just go there with these transactions. Uh, we can't go there with these Christmas lists of, you know, IPR, human rights in Tibet, uh, you know, all these, you know, new rights for the Uyghurs, and, you know, we need to say, what is the most important thing? And then, what's the second most important thing? Then, what is the third most important thing? We need to have some sense of priorities yeah. and a sense that uh, we're serious about this. I would humbly suggest we put North Korea on the top. All that is to say, Mark, that uh, I think if we really, the key to re-engaging is to get a China that really begins to see it the way we do, yeah. really begins to see North Korea as an impediment to their future integration, to global China, if you will. I mean, the irony is you have this medium-sized country, Korea, understanding the need to be global, and then you have a country that should have an aspiration of being a global power, in fact, many of our neocons believe they already have that aspiration to be a global power, acting very provincially and acting with just complete obsession with their internal politics. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we got a bit of that, but the Chinese got a lot of that. So I think if we could kind of work closely with the Chinese, I mean, talk about what happens if we wake up and there's no more North Korea. Chinese hate that subject, by the, time, by the way. So the first time you say it, they would try to change subjects. Second time, they change subjects. Third, you know, by the time you get to 49 or 59, by the way, as a negotiator, you've got to be willing to keep the same amount of enthusiasm in saying things 50 times as you did the first time. And I think if we finally got through with, uh, on that with the Chinese, we'd make some progress. But it's not going to be, it's not going to happen if our Secretary of State has this long list starting with soybean sales and uh, ending with, you know, who knows, more, uh, you know, Boeing sales. They need to be very focused on what we want and what our priorities are. Yep. So that, that's my, uh, is it impossible to, to squeeze the North Koreans? It is not impossible. And I think people who look at North Korea, it may be an impossible state, as uh, Victor Cha so eloquently said, but it doesn't mean that our policy to that state is impossible. And I think if you've got China, U.S., Russia, really putting heat on those mm. guys, uh, they would cave. They are not so special. 
they are not such a, you know, so, you know, a, a country that uh, you know can somehow withstand the pressure that no one else could stand. I would stand. I mean, I think we could really, we could really jam them if we could get together and do it together. Good. Well, uh, uh, I, I couldn't agree more that uh, 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 we're all in the business of leverage and. Uh, and uh, China is the place where uh, we've got to get movement with that leverage. Thank you all for coming, and uh, great Thanks, to Chris. see you again. Thank you. Yeah.